by 2050 we'll have more plastic waste than fish by weight in the ocean if we don't stop stuff the way we're doing it now, so that's unacceptable. Hi, I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at Wake Forest University and Academic Influence. And today we have a special guest coming to us from Sydney, Australia, Professor Mushmeyer, who is a chemist, but also one who solves a lot of problems. And you're down under, Professor Mushmeyer, um, and, uh, and yet you're from Germany originally. So how did that all work out? Oh, well, Australia obviously is a wonderful place in itself, um, but it's made even more wonderful because I have uh, married to an Australian lady um, who I met many years ago on her obligatory European trip, as many Europeans, uh, as many Australians, I think Canadians, uh, have almost as a rite of passage. And, uh, and yes, yeah, so I'm a self-funding travel souvenir, really. Oh, wonderful. So it really was a match made in heaven. So uh, yes. you, you came down from Hamburg, Germany, to Australia to do your undergraduate and graduate degrees. And That's then correct. you went back to Europe from, for some time and then found your way back to Australia. And that's where you're currently that's doing your work. Uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the things that I'm, I'm interested about is your batteries that you've been working on. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say is the difference between your batteries and some of the other batteries that exist out there from sort of a technical point? Right. So uh, the other two batteries are principally lead acid batteries and lithium ion batteries. The worldwide market for that is about $90 billion. And they at the moment are roughly 50-50, so about 45 billion each. Uh, we are not there, uh, but you know, we'll try and scrape into that market a little bit. Um, so we are a zinc bromine battery. And uh, what that does is it is a basically a zinc plating machine. It plates out zinc as I charge the battery on an electrode and it generates bromine on the other side of the electrode and bromine normally is a problem because it's very reactive and that's where the battery gets its power from but we've uh, developed a patented you know, chemical formulation which uh, renders the bromine more or less harmless and uh, still uh, retains its capability of reacting so what that means is that uh, we can go down to what's called zero state of charge. So we can run the battery completely flat. And normally other batteries die after that or you know, never really recover. Uh, whereas we love it. Zero is just fantastic. It, it, it uh, replenishes all the electrode surfaces and rejuvenates them, makes them just like the new battery. Wow. And the second thing is um, other, the other two battery technologies really don't like the heat. And as it is proper for an Australian battery technology, uh, we love the heat. Um, so uh, 45 degrees of running temperature, no problem at all. Um, so, the, so, so that is actually a very nice spot for us. So to go down to zero state of charge, to do that at 45 degrees, um, it's just uh, brilliant for us and other batteries die. So therefore, we have this capability to go into markets where there is a need for solar battery solution, but where the batteries currently are not really up to the job. The batteries can do it, of course, but, but they will die much more quickly than one would think. So they can die between you know, six months, nine months, 12 months, and then they're gone. And if it's a remote area, the replacement cost itself, plus somebody in a little white van, driving out there, doing the job, driving back, and it may be three, 400 kilometers at a pop, that's expensive. So, uh, so, so, so our robustness uh, and what's called abuse tolerance um, is, really, uh, is really important. So that's the difference. That's great. And what is the secret behind protecting the bromide from being so reactive? Yeah, so we uh, have what's called a self-assembled uh, nanogel. So think about toothpaste. Um, and uh, the bromine as it is uh, generated within the toothpaste is encapsulated on a molecular level by like a tiny little uh, bubble of, uh, of this toothpaste gel. And uh, that bubble just reduces the reactivity of the bromine enough so that I can actually put my hand into the toothpaste and wash the toothpaste off, and I'm not badly affected. Whereas if I put the hand into pure bromine, uh, I need to go to hospital very quickly and, you know, I might have some issues. So uh, it's really that self-assembled nanogel uh, that was the first patent that uh, that makes all the difference. 
Right. And you said that uh, you like to look at problems and find out where the bottleneck is and see if it's a chemical problem uh, at the bottleneck and then try to open that up. So can you describe how it was that you found, okay, uh, was it that you noticed that the batteries were dying of the other two types of batteries? Or did you notice that this third type of battery just didn't have a good way to um, to to harness the, you know, the bromide and, and keep it under control or yeah. yeah, describe the process a little bit. Yeah. So, so, so the process started with uh, my view that really the electricity network needed to get additional buffer capacity to, to be able to accommodate all the renewable energy that was undoubtedly coming in. And uh, then I thought, so why isn't there more already? And what was clear was that the battery technologies out there did not quite have the characteristics that were necessary for some of these applications I spoke about, especially in the agricultural sector uh, for desalination, irrigation, and pumping, etc. So uh, I thought, so why is that? I uh, had a look and understood why it was the case. Uh, looked for at alternative battery technologies, and zinc bromine looked very promising, but um, that was only available in what's called a flow battery. So we have a similar electrode setup. But then I have two large tanks uh, which pump the electrolyte around the electrodes. And that has some advantages and some disadvantages. And the principal disadvantage is cost and complexity. So it's really a chemical plant one buys, which needs to be serviced, that makes noise, and it's quite expensive. So I thought, well, how can I change that chemistry and make it into a non-flow chemistry? And um, this encapsulation came up very quickly as a key point. And I had a failed experiment from some years before with a student, and uh, we tried to make a membrane out of something that's called an ionic liquid. And um, that sort of worked, but never really did work. But it had something in it that was special, and it captured a bromine bromide-like substance, and it was able to selectively transport that. And I thought, you know, one of these days, you know, maybe it'll be useful for something. So I had it in my top drawer. And as I realized that there was a need for this special bromine handling, I thought, well, I've got something, don't I? So I tried that out and it worked like a charm. And uh, we never looked back. Wow, that is so fascinating. Well, you've really made some progress with your battery project, but of course, that's not the only thing you, you've worked on over your career. Um, can you just tell us briefly, what is it that makes it possible to sort of bring out the, the carbon in throwaway plastic items that usually are burned back yeah. into the sort of a useful economic cycle for using those kinds of carbons. What, what, what was the secret there, the secret special right. thing that you did there? Uh, so, so, so we've got this technology called CAT HDR, so catalytic hydrothermal reactor technology that we are rolling out worldwide, uh, including in Canada, the UK, Germany, Australia, um, and maybe Japan. And uh, what, uh, what that does for the plastics is it helps to make really stable products in high yield, much more stable and much higher yield than alternative technologies. So the alternative one, the first one up, is, of course, to burn it just for heat, you know, in a waste incinerator. And, and they've, been, they've been around for some time. But that's not the best use of that resource, because if you think about it, those plastic films and plastic bags and whatever, that's, pure, that's already from refined crude oil, has gone through a refinery, has been theft around with a lot of value added just to burn it. It's, it, it's a waste. So burning is not good. Landfill is even worse because you don't get anything from it and throwing it into the ocean. Oops, you know, done it again. Uh, that's no good. By 2050, we'll have more plastic waste than fish by weight in the ocean if we don't stop stuff the way we're doing it now. So that's unacceptable. So throwing away landfill and burning is not acceptable. The next one is pyrolysis, and that is to break down the plastic with heat and it breaks bonds. But those bonds, where they're broken, they are very, very reactive. And the uh, broken bonds want to react together again and make a lot of intractable solid that is useless and has to be thrown away or burned. And uh, that's no good. So what we've come up with is a supercritical water. So that's water which is like a gas, but it's so heavily compressed to act like a liquid. It's a fourth state of, of matter, really. And uh, we can't experience it because if we did, 
we would die instantly. So it would be a very short moment of recognition. Um, so, uh, so we take this water, and under those conditions, the water transfers heat, transfers mass, so it pushes it through the reactor. But also, it is able to donate some of its hydrogen atoms to where the bonds are broken. And that stabilizes our, our breaking down plastics. And it means that we make almost no waste, almost no carbon. It's about 5% or so of this intractable stuff. Uh, so 0.5% of the intractable stuff that we make and, uh, and um, uh, on a carbon basis, whereas others might make 40 or 50%. So we make 0.5%. Uh, and what comes out, because it is uh, stabilized with the hydrogen, is you know, very, uh, very easy to further process. And we immediately make three uh, different uh, streams that we can sell on, uh, on sell the naphtha, light cycle oil, and industrial waxes straight out of the mixed plastic in one, in one step, just by separation with distillation. So that's really unique and uh, and the process economics because I don't need extra hydrogen to calm down or reprocess what I've got. The process economics are sensational. Wow, that is just amazing to think about those little hydrogen atoms in the supercritical water going and kind of protecting those reactive bonds, just sealing them off uh, so it. that nothing nothing can turn into the black tar that you can't do anything with. That's fascinating. So um, my last set of questions are just about the environment down in Australia. You've you've been lucky enough to uh, to live there for a long time. And having been there, I realized that it is very different even from Europe in its concern for the environment and its mm. uh, desire to protect things. Um, why do you think that is? And, and is it true that it's even, I mean, it's certainly better than the United States, but is it even better than most parts of Europe and why? Yes, so uh, we do have, uh, I guess similar to, to Canada, we do have a strong mineral sector and that mineral sector tends to be potentially somewhat less concerned about environmental impact. But therefore, the population as a whole uh, balances that out beautifully. And uh, overall, uh, I think the Australian voters are very uh, concerned about the environment. Uh, the bushfires, obviously, are uh, a yearly reminder um, of, uh, of, of, of advancing climate change. Um, so, so this is really top, uh, top, top priority. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that, that that is one of the things. And we have a beautiful, pristine place. We've only been here for... 200 years. Obviously, the First Nations have been here for 60,000 years, and they looked after the place pretty well until we came. Uh, and we, I think, have an increasing awareness of the of the role they played, and also the role we've played in changing the environment. And maybe we need to synthesize those two elements mm -hmm. and come up with a new way. And I think there is a broad support for that in society, and that that shows itself through lots of different actions in terms of, you know, protecting wild rivers, protecting native bushlands, protecting animal habitat, et cetera. Mm, yes. And this, this uh, saline basin that's sort of right there, if, if you look at the kidney shape of, of Australia, mm. it's sort of right in the bottom part of Australia. And you were saying that it has a, a salty layer, a freshwater layer, and then a salty layer on top. And, and your technology with the batteries allows uh, farmers to pump out the salty layer that's on top so that it doesn't come up and ruin the crops. Um, right. and, and you were saying that they also get water out of pumping that up. Is that because then they desalinate that uh, right. salty water? So, okay. so, so, so we are, we are you know, once you have a pump, you basically have a desalination system, depending what kind of desalination it is, with reverse osmosis, that's just basically pumping hard. Um, so, uh, so the, with, with some membranes. So, so yes, they can reduce the the saline level um, of the of the water table, and get then with desalination water for use in agriculture. Mm. And they can do that twenty four seven with a solar battery installation, and you don't need to ship diesel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So once the initial capex is made. It just uh, you know runs runs on its own effectively, and wow. uh, that can really make a big big difference because arable land mass is I think one of the critical areas going forward for the world, mm -hmm. not just Australia. Yeah, not just Australia, but Australia certainly has uh, that as a big big issue. Now, um, for those of us who who uh, are in the United States, picturing you know uh, the westward expansion and windmills, which brought the water up from the Great Plains, um, how efficient? 
is uh, a windmill in bringing up water compared to a solar panel attached to an electric pump? How do those compare? Right. Um, that might be slightly outside of my uh, precise expertise. Um, so when the windmills run, uh, obviously obviously it's about the, the conversion of the mechanical energy of the wind into the mechanical energy of the, of the rotating, rotating windmill. Now, if that were to run an electric motor, once I have the spinning happening, and I don't know what the conversion is there, but the electric motor runs at 95, 98% efficiency. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, I, that's something maybe I'll look into later, but it certainly is wonderful that you're taking one of the plentiful resources in Australia, which is sun power, and turning it into something that can really help agriculture as well as so many other things. So, wow. Well, it's just so wonderful to hear all these encouraging technologies that are coming out of your laboratory and out of Australia generally. Um, Professor Mushmeyer, it's just been so wonderful to have you on this program. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, for thank you for having me and uh, good luck with your further work. <laughs>